grand jury is in session. Uh, there is a quorum. There are no unauthorized persons in the grand jury room and they're prepared to receive the testimony of the president. Thank you, Mr. Abson. Mr. President, would you raise your right hand, you saw, Mr. Testimony without giving the family the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so don't be done. I do. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon. Could you please uh, state your full name for the record, sir? William Jefferson Clinton. My name is Saul Weisenberg. I'm a Deputy Independent Counsel with the Office of Independent Counsel. With me today are uh, some other attorneys from the Office of Independent Counsel. At the courthouse are the ladies and gentlemen of the grand jury prepared to receive your testimony as you give. Do you understand, sir? Yes, I do. Uh, this proceeding is subject to Rule 6E of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure as modified by Judge Johnson's order. You are appearing voluntarily today as part of an agreement worked out between your attorney, the Office of the Independent Counsel, and with the approval of Judge uh, Johnson. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. Mr. Weisberg, excuse me, you referred to Judge Johnson's order. I'm not familiar with that order. Have we uh, been served that or, or not? No, my understanding is that uh, uh, that is an order that uh, the judge is going to sign uh, today. She didn't have the name. District Court for the District of Columbia. You understand that, sir? I do. And uh, among other things, is currently uh, investigating under the authority of the Court of Appeals upon application by the Attorney General whether Monica Lewinsky or others obstructed justice, intimidated witnesses, or committed uh, other crimes related to the case of Jones versus uh, Clinton. You understand that, sir? I do. And today, uh, you will be receiving questions not only from attorneys on the OIC staff, but from uh, some of the grand jurors, too. Do you understand? Yes, sir, I do. I'm going to talk briefly about your rights and responsibilities <laughs> as a grand jury witness. Uh, normally, grand jury witnesses, while not allowed to have attorneys in the grand jury room with them, uh, can stop and consult with their attorneys. Under our arrangement today, uh, your attorneys are here and present for consultation and you can break to consult with them as necessary, but it won't count against our total time. You understand that? Sir? I do understand that. You have a uh, privilege against self-incrimination. If a truthful answer to any question would tend to incriminate you, uh, you can invoke the privilege and that invocation will not be used against you. You understand that? I do. And if you don't invoke it, however, any answer that you do give can and will be used against you. Do you understand that? Sir? I do. Mr. President, you understand that your testimony here today is under oath? I do. And you understand that because you have sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, uh, that if you were to lie or intentionally mislead the grand jury, you could be prosecuted for perjury and or obstruction of justice? I believe that's correct. Is there anything that you uh, I've stated to you regarding your rights and responsibilities that you would like to clarify that you don't understand. No, sir. I'd like to read for you uh, a portion of Federal Rule of Evidence 603, which discusses the important function the oath has in our judicial system. It says that the purpose of the oath is one, quote, calculated to awaken the witness's conscience and impress the witness's mind with the duty, end quote, tell the truth. Could you please tell the grand jury what that oath means to you for today's testimony? I have sworn an oath to tell the grand jury the truth and that's what I intend to do. You understand that it requires you to give the whole truth. That is a complete answer to each question, sir. 
I will answer each question as accurately and fully as I can. Now, you took the same oath uh, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on January 17, 1998, in a deposition in the Paul Jones litigation. Is that correct, sir? I did take an oath then. Did the oath you took on that occasion mean the same to you then as it does today? I believe then that I had to answer the questions truthfully. That's correct. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, sir. I believe that I had to answer the questions truthfully. That's correct. And it, and it meant the same to you then as it does today? Well, no one read me a definition then, and we didn't go through this exercise then. I swore an oath to tell the truth, and I believed I was bound to be truthful, and I tried to be. At the uh, Paul Jones deposition, you were represented by uh, Mr. Robert Bennett, your counsel, is that correct? That is correct. He was authorized by you to be a representative there, your attorney, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, your counsel, Mr. Bennett, indicated at page 5 of the deposition, lines 10 through 12, I'm uh, quoting, the president intends to give full and complete answers as Ms. Jones is entitled to have, end quote. My question to you is, do you agree with your counsel that a plaintiff in a sexual harassment case is, to use his words, entitled to have the truth? I believe that I was bound to give truthful answers. Yes, sir. But the question is, sir, do you agree with your counsel that a plaintiff in a sexual harassment case is entitled to have the truth? I believe when a witness is under oath uh, in a civil case or otherwise under oath, the witness should do everything possible to answer the questions truthfully. I'm going to turn over questioning now to Mr. Bittman of our office, Mr. President. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon, Mr. Bittman. My name is Robert Bittman. I'm attorney with the Office of Independent Counsel. Mr. President, we are first going to turn to some of the details of your relationship with Monica Lewinsky and the follow-up on your deposition that you provided the Paula Jones case uh, as was referenced on January 17, 1998. The questions are uncomfortable, and I apologize for that in advance. I will try to be as brief and direct as possible. Mr. President, were you physically intimate with Monica Lewinsky? Mr. Bittman, I think maybe I can save the view and the grandeur is a lot of time if uh, I read a statement which I think will make it clear what the, the nature of my relationship with Ms. Lewinsky was, how it related to the testimony I gave, what I was trying to do in that testimony, and I think it will perhaps make it possible for you to uh, ask it even more relevant questions from your point of view. And with your permission, I'd like to read that statement. Absolutely. Please, Mr. President. When I was alone with Ms. Lewinsky, on certain occasions in early 1996 and once in early 1997, I engaged in conduct that was wrong. These encounters did not consist of sexual intercourse. They did not constitute sexual relations as I understood that term to be defined at my January 17, 1998 deposition but they did involve inappropriate intimate contact. These inappropriate encounters ended at my insistence in early 1997. I also had occasional telephone conversations with Ms. Lewinsky that included inappropriate sexual banner. I regret that what began as a friendship came to include this conduct and I take full responsibility for my actions. While I will provide the jury whatever other information I can, because of privacy considerations affecting my family, myself, and others, 
and in an effort to preserve the dignity of the office I hold. This is all I will say about the specifics of these particular matters. I will try to answer to the best of my ability other questions, including questions about my relationship with Ms. Lewinsky, questions about my understanding of the term sexual relations as I understood it to be defined at my January 17, 1998 deposition, and questions concerning alleged subordination of perjury, obstruction of justice, and intimidation of witnesses. That, Mr. Bittman, is my statement. Thank you, Mr. President. And with that, we would like to take a break. Would you like to have this? Yes, please. Why don't we have that marked as Grand Jury Exhibit WJC 1. So we're going to take a yeah, break. Take a break, and we have the camera off now, please. Mr. President, your statement indicates that you, your contacts with Ms. Lewinsky did not involve any inappropriate, intimate contact. Mr. Bittman, no, sir. It indicates that it did involve inappropriate, intimate contact. Perfect. It did involve inappropriate, intimate. Yes, sir. It did. Mr. Bittman, the witness, the witness has not had a copy of the statement. Thank you. Was this contact with Ms. Lewinsky, Mr. President, did it involve any sexual contact in any way, shape, or form? Mr. Bittman, I said in the statement, I would like to state the terms of the statement. I think it's clear what inappropriately intimate is. I have said what it did not include. It did not include sexual intercourse, and I do not believe it included conduct which falls within the definition I was given in the Jones deposition. And I would like to stay with that characterization. Let's then move to the definition that was provided you during your deposition. We will have that marked as Grand Jury Exhibit WJC2. This is an exact copy, Mr. President, of the exhibit that was provided you during that deposition. And I'm sure you remember from the deposition that paragraph one of the definition remained in effect. Judge Wright ruled that that was to be the guiding definition and that paragraphs two and three were stricken. Do you remember that, Mr. President? Yes. Specifically, what I remember is there were two different discussions, I think, of this. There was quite an extended one in the beginning, and everybody was entering into it. And then in the end, the judge said that she would take the first definition and strike the rest of it. That's my memory. Did you, well, at page 19 of your deposition in the case, the attorney who provided you with the definition asked you, would you please take whatever time you need to read the definition? And later on in the deposition, you did, of course, refer to the definition several times. Were you, during the deposition, familiar with the definition? Yes, sir. Maya, let me just ask a question. If you're going to ask me about my deposition, could I have a copy of it? Does anybody have a copy of it? We have a copy. We'll provide you with a copy. The full record is on Grand Jury Exhibit Judge Jersey. Excuse me. Yes, thank you. Now, did you say that was on page 19, Mr. Bittman? Page 19, Mr. President, beginning at line 21. And I'll read it in full. This is from the Jones attorney. 
would you please take whatever time you need to read this definition because when I use the term sexual relations, this is what I mean today. So that starts on 19, and let me say <clears throat> that there is a, uh, just for the record, uh, it, it, my recollection was uh, accurate. There's a long discussion here between the attorneys and the judge. It goes on to page 23, and in the end, the judge says, uh, I'm talking only about part one and the definition. And uh, do you understand that? And I answer, I do. And the judge says part one, and then the, the lawyer for Ms. Jones says he's only talking about part one. They ask me if I understand it. I say I do, and that was my understanding. I might also note that uh, when I was given this and began to ask questions about it, I actually circled number one. This is my circle here. I remember doing that so I could focus only on those two lines, which is what I did. Did you understand the words in the first portion of the exhibit, Mr. President, that is, for the purposes of this de deposition, a person engages in quote unquote sexual relations and the person knowingly engages in or causes. Did you understand, do you understand the words there in that phrase? Yes, my, I can tell you what my understanding of the definition is if you want me to sure. do it. <clears throat> my understanding of this definition is that uh, it covers contact by the person being deposed with the enumerated areas if the contact is done with an intent to arouse or gratify. That's my understanding of the definition. What did you believe the, the definition to include and exclude? What kinds of Activity. I thought the definition included any activity by the, the person being deposed, where the person was the actor and, and uh, came in contact with those parts of the bodies with the purpose of intent or gratification, and excluded any other activity. For example, kissing is not covered by that, I don't think. Did you understand the definition to be limited to sexual activity? Yes, I understood the definition to be limited to, to physical contact with those areas of the body with the specific intent to arouse or gratify. That's what I understood it to be. What specific acts did the definition include as you understood the definition on January 17, 1998? Any contact with the areas there mentioned, sir. Uh, if, you contacted the, if you contacted those parts of the body with an intent to arouse or gratify, that is covered. What did you understand? The person being deposed. If the person being deposed contacted those parts of another person's body with an intent to arouse or gratify, that was covered. What did you understand the word causes in the first phrase? Is. The purposes of this deposition, the person engages in sexual relations when the person knowingly causes contact. I don't know what that means. It doesn't make any sense to me in this context. Because uh, I, I think what I thought there was, since this was some sort of, as I remember they said in the previous discussion, and I'm only remembering now, so if I make a mistake you can correct me. 
as I remember from the previous discussion, they said this was some kind of definition that had something to do with sexual harassment. So uh, may, that implies it's forcing to me. And, I, and there was never any issue of forcing in the, in the case involving, uh, uh, well, any of these questions they were asking me. They made it clear in this discussion I just reviewed that what they were referring to was intentional sexual conduct, not some sort of forcible uh, abusive behavior. So I, I basically, <clears throat> I don't think I paid any attention to it because it appeared to me that that was something that was, had no reference to the facts on, that they admitted they were asking me about. So if I can be clear, Mr. President, is it, was it your understanding <clears throat> back in January that the definition now marked as Grand Jury Exhibit 2 only included consensual sexual activity? Now, my understanding, let me go back and say, my understanding, I'll tell you what it did include. My understanding was, when I was giving it, was that what was covered in those first two lines was any direct contact by the person being deposed with those parts of another person's body if the contact was done with an intent to arouse or gratify. That's what I believed it meant. That's what I believed it meant then. Read that's what I believe it means today. I'm just trying to understand, Mr. President, you indicated that you put the definition in the context of the sexual harassment case. No, no, I think it was not in the context of sexual harassment. I just reread those four pages, which I, obviously the grand jury doesn't have. But there was some reference to the fact that this definition apparently bore some, had some connection to some uh, definition in another context, and that this was being used not in that context, not necessarily in the context of sexual harassment. So I would think that this causes would be, would, would means to force someone to do something. That's what I read it. That's the only point I'm trying to make. Therefore, I did not believe that anyone had ever suggested that I had uh, uh, forced anyone to do anything and that I, uh, and I did not do that. And so that could not have had any bearing on any questions related to Ms. Lewinsky. Oh, since you have now read portions of the transcript again, that you were reminded that you did not ask for any clarification of the terms. Is that correct? Of the definition? No, sir. I thought it was a rather, when I read it, I thought it was rather strange with the definition. Uh, but it was the one the judge decided on, and I was bound by it, so I took it. During the deposition, you remember that Ms. Lewinsky's name came up and you were asked several questions about her. Do you remember that? Yes, sir, I do. During those, before those questions actually got started, your attorney, Mr. Bennett, objected to any questions about Ms. Lewinsky, and he represented to Judge Wright, who was presiding. That was unusual, wasn't it, that a federal judge would come and actually, in your experience, that a federal judge would come and preside at a deposition? Mr. Excuse me, could you identify the transcript page on which Mr. Bennett objected to all testimony about Ms. Lewinsky before it got started? The objection, this quote that I am referring to, is going to begin at page 54 of the deposition. That is the end of the testimony, though, after the testimony about Ms. Lewinsky has begun, is it not? Mr. President, is it unusual for a federal judge to preside over a civil deposition? I think it is, but this was an unusual case. I, I believe I know why she did it. Your attorney, Mr. Bennett, objected to the questions about Ms. Lewinsky, didn't he? What page is that on, sir? Page 54. Where he questions whether the attorneys for Ms. Jones had a good faith basis to ask some of the questions that they were posing to you. His objections actually begin on page 53, since the president pointed out that the grand jurors correctly do not have a copy of the deposition. I will read the portion uh, that I'm referring to. And this begins uh, at line one of page 54. I question the good faith of counsel, the innuendo of the question. Counsel is fully aware that Ms. Lewinsky has filed, has an affidavit which they are in possession of, 
saying that there is absolutely no sex of any kind in any manner, shape, or form with President Clinton. Where is that? That is on page 54, Mr. <coughs> beginning at line one. About midway through line one. Well, actually, in the present tense, that's an accurate statement. Uh, that was an accurate. That was an accurate statement. If, if I don't, I think what Mr. Bennett was concerned about, if I, maybe it would be helpful to you and to the grand jurors. Quite apart from these comments. Um, if I could tell you what his state of mind was, what my state of mind was, and why I think the judge was there in the first place. If you don't want me to do it, I won't. But I think it will help to explain a lot of this. Well, we are interested, and I, I know from the questions that we've received from the grand jurors, they are interested in knowing what was going on in your mind when you were reading Grand Jury Exhibit uh, 2, and what you understood that definition to include. Our question goes to whether, and you were familiar, and what Mr. Bennett was referring to, obviously, is Mrs. Linsky's affidavit. And uh, we'll have that marked, Mr. President, as Grand Jury Exhibit WJC4. And you remember that Ms. Lewinsky's affidavit said that she had had no sexual relationship with you. you remember that? I do. And you remember in the deposition that Mr. Bennett asked you about that. This is at the end of the, of the, at the towards the end of the uh, deposition. And you indicated, to, he asked you whether the statement that Ms. Lewinsky made in her affidavit was True. And you indicated that it was absolutely correct. I did. And at the time that she made the statement, and indeed to the present day, because as far as I know, she was never deposed since the judge ruled she would not be permitted to testify in a case the judge ruled had no merit. That is, this case we're talking about. Uh, I believe at the time that she filled out this affidavit if she believed that the de definition of sexual relationship was two people having intercourse then this is accurate and i believe that is the definition that most ordinary americans would give it if you said jane and harry have a sexual relationship and you're not talking about people being drawn into a lawsuit and being given definitions and then a great effort to trick them in some way but you're just talking about people in ordinary conversation I'll bet the grand jurors, if they were talking about two people they know and said they have a sexual relationship, they meant they were sleeping together. They meant they were having intercourse together. So I'm not at all sure that this affidavit is not true and was not true in Ms. Lewinsky's mind at the time she swore it out. Did you talk with Ms. Lewinsky about what she meant to write in her affidavit? I didn't talk to her about how her definition. I did not know what was in this affidavit before it was filled out specifically. I did not know what words was used, were used specifically before it was filled out or what meaning she gave to them, but I'm just telling you that uh, it's certainly true what she says here, that we didn't have, uh, there was no employment, no benefit in exchange, there was nothing uh, having anything to do with sexual harassment. And if she defines sexual relationship <clears throat> in the way I think most Americans do, meaning intercourse, then she told the truth. And that depends on what was in her mind. I don't know what was in her mind. You'll have to ask her that. Would you indicated before that you were aware of what she intended by the term sexual relationship. No, sir. I said I thought that, that this could be a truthful affidavit. And when I read it, since that's the way I would define it, since keep in mind she was not, she was not bound by this sexual relations definition, which is highly unusual. I think anybody would admit that. Uh, when she used two different terms, sexual relationship, if she meant by that what most people mean by it, then that is not an untruthful statement. So your definition of sexual relationship is 
sexual relationship is intercourse only, is that correct? No, not necessarily intercourse only, but it would include intercourse. I believe, <clears throat> I believe that the common understanding of the term, if you say two people are having a sexual relationship, most people believe that includes intercourse. So if that's what Ms. Lewinsky thought, then this is a truthful affidavit. I don't know what was in her mind, but if that's what she thought, the affidavit is true. What else would sexual relationship include besides intercourse? Well, that, I think, uh, let me answer what I said before. I think most people, when they use that term, include sexual relationships and what other, whatever other sexual contact is involved in a particular relationship. But they think it includes intercourse as well. And I would thought so uh, before I got into this case uh, and uh, heard all I've heard and seen all I've seen, I would have thought that, that that's what nearly everybody thought it meant. Well, I ask, Mr. President, because you're <laughs> using the very document, Grand Jury Exhibit 4, WJC 4, represented to Judge Wright that his understanding of the meaning of that affidavit, which you've indicated you thought, Ms. Lewinsky thought was, she was referring just to intercourse. He says to Judge Wright that it meant absolutely no sex of any kind in any manner, shape, or form. Well, let me say this. <clears throat> I didn't have any discussion, uh, obviously at this moment, with Mr. Bennett. I, I'm not even sure I paid much attention to what he was saying. I was think I was ready to get on with my testimony here, and they were having these constant uh, discussions all through the deposition. But that statement, in the present tense at least, is not inaccurate, if that's what Mr. Bennett meant. That is, at the time that he said that, and for some time before, that would be a completely accurate statement. Now, I don't believe that he was, uh, I, I don't know what he meant. You'd have to talk to him, because I just wasn't involved in this, and I didn't pay much attention to what was being said. I was just waiting for him to get back to me. So I can't comment on or be held responsible for whatever he said about that, I don't think. Well, if you, did you agree with me that if he misled Judge Wright in some way, that you would have corrected the record? and said, excuse me, Mr. Bennett, uh, I think the judge is getting a misimpression by what you're saying. If Mr. Bennett was representing me, I wasn't representing him. And I wasn't even paying much attention to this conversation, which is why when you started asking me about this, I asked to see the deposition. I was focusing on my answers to the questions. And uh, I told you what I believe about this deposition, which I believe to be true. Uh, and it's obvious, and, and I think by your questions, you have betrayed that the, the, the Jones lawyer's strategy in this case had nothing to do with uncovering or proving sexual harassment. Uh, by the time this discovery started, they knew they had a bad case on the law, and they knew what our evidence was. They knew they had a lousy case on the facts. And so their strategy, since they were being funded by my political opponents, was to have this dragnet of discovery they wanted to cover everybody, and they convinced the judge, because she gave them strict orders not to leak, that they should be treated like other plaintiffs and other civil cases, and how could they ever know whether there had been any sexual harassment unless they first knew whether there had been any sex. And so with that broad mandate, limited by time and employment in the federal or state government, they proceeded to cross the country and try to turn up whatever they could not because they thought it would help their case. By the time they did this discovery, they knew what this deal was in their case, and they knew what was going to happen, and Judge Wright subsequently threw it out. What they, now, let me finish, Mr. Bennett. You, uh, Mr. <laughs> I mean, you brought this up. Excuse me, Mr. Bittman. What they wanted to do, and what they did do, and what they had done by the time I showed up here was to find any negative information they could on me, whether it was true or not, get it in a deposition, and then leak it, even though it was illegal to do so. It happened repeatedly. The judge gave them orders. One of the reasons she was sitting in that deposition was because she was trying to make sure that it didn't get out of hand. But that was their strategy. 
And they did a good job of it, and they got away with it. I've been subject to quite a lot of illegal leaking, and they had a very determined, deliberate strategy because their real goal was to hurt me. When they knew they couldn't win the lawsuit, they thought, well, maybe we can pummel and Maybe they thought I'd settle. Maybe they just thought they would get some political advantage out of it. But that's what was going on here. Now, I'm trying to be honest with you, and it hurts me. And I'm trying to be, tell you the truth about what happened between Ms. Lewinsky and me. But that does not change the fact that the real reason they were zeroing in on anybody was to try to get any person in there, no matter how uninvolved with Paula Jones, no matter how uninvolved with sexual harassment, so they could hurt me politically. That's what was going on. Because by then, by this time, this thing had been going on a long time. They knew what our evidence was. They knew what the law was in the circuit in which we were bringing this case. And so they just thought they would take a wrecking ball to me and see if they could do some damage. Judge Wright had ruled that the attorneys in the Jones case were permitted to ask you certain questions. He certainly did, and they asked them, and I did my best to answer them. I'm just trying and to tell you what my state of mind was. to answer those questions truthfully, Mr. President. It was. But it was not my responsibility in the face of their repeated illegal leaking. It was not my responsibility to volunteer a lot of information. There are many cases in this deposition where I gave, and keep in mind, I prepared, I treated them, frankly, uh, with respect. I prepared very well for this deposition on the Jones matters. I prepared very well on that. I did not know uh, that uh, Linda Tripp had been involved in the preparation of this deposition or that all you know of them. Uh, no, I don't. I just know that what, what I read in the papers about it. But I had no way of knowing that they would ask me all these detailed questions. I did the best I could to answer them. But in this deposition, Mr. Bittman, I was doing my best to be truthful. I was not trying to be particularly helpful to them. And I didn't think I had an obligation to be particularly helpful to them to further, when I knew that there was no evidence here of sexual harassment, and I knew what they wanted to do was to leak this even though it was unlawful to do so. You That's what I knew. President, mean. that you had an obligation to make sure that the presiding federal judge was on board and had the correct facts. Did you believe that was your obligation? Sir, I was trying to answer my testimony. I was thinking about my testimony. I don't believe I ever even focused on what Mr. Bennett said in the exact words he did until I started reading this transcript carefully for this hearing. That moment, that whole argument just passed me by. I was a witness. I was trying to focus on what I said and how I said it. And believe me, I knew what the purpose of the deposition was. And sure enough, by the way, it did all leak, just like I knew it would. Let me ask you, Mr. President, you indicate in your statement that you were alone with Ms. Levinsky. Is that right? Yes, sir. How many times were you alone with Ms. Levinsky? Let me begin with the correct answer. I don't know for sure, but if you would like me to given an educated guess, I will do that, but I do not know for sure. And I will tell you what I think based on what I remember. But I can't be held to a specific time because I don't have records of all of it. How many times do you think? Well, you have, there are two different periods here. There's uh, the period when she worked in the White House until April of 96. And then there's the period when she came back to visit me from February 97 until late December 97. Based on our records, let's start with the records where we have the best records and the closest in time. Based on our records uh, between February and December, uh, it appears to me that at least I could have seen her approximately uh, nine times. Although I do not believe I saw her quite that many times, at least it could have happened. Uh, there were, we think there were nine or 10 times when she was in, in the White House when I was in the Oval Office when I could have seen her. I do not believe I saw her that many times, but I could have. Now, we have no records for uh, the time when she was an employee at the White House. 
because we have no records of that for any of the employees at the White House, that, unless there was some formally scheduled meeting that was uh, on the on the uh, calendar for the day. I remember, I'll tell you what I remember. I remember uh, meeting her or having my first real conversation with her during the government shutdown in November of 95 when she, uh, the, the, as I explained in my deposition, during the government shutdown, the, the most federal employees were actually prohibited from coming to work even in the White House. There were, most people in the White House couldn't come to work. The Chief of Staff could come to work. My National Security Advisor could come to work actually. Therefore, interns were assigned to all offices. And I believe it was her last week as an intern. Anyway, she worked in the Chief of Staff's office. One night she brought me some pizza. We had some remarks. Now, the next time I remember seeing her alone was on a couple of occasions when she was working in the Legislative Affairs Office as a full-time employee. I remember specifically, I have a specific recollection of two times, I don't remember when they were, but I remember twice when on Sunday afternoon she brought papers down to me, stayed, and we were alone. And I am frankly quite sure, although I have no specific memory, I am quite sure there were a couple of more times, probably uh, two times more, three times more. I, that's what I would say. That's what I can remember. But I do not remember when they were or at what time of day they were or what the facts were. But I have a general memory that would say I certainly saw her more than twice during that period between January and April of 1996 when she worked there. So if I could summarize your testimony, approximately five times you saw her before she left the White House and approximately nine times after she left the employment of the White House? I don't, there were several times in 97, I've told you that I've looked at my calendar and I'll tell you what I think the outer limits are. Uh, I, I would think that would sound about right. There could be, in, in that first four month period, there, maybe there's one or two more, maybe there's one less. I just don't know, I don't remember, I didn't keep records. But I'm giving you what I specifically remember and then what I generally remember. I'm doing the best to be helpful to you. Have you reviewed the records for December 28, 1997, Mr. President? Yes, sir, I have. Do you believe that Mr. Lewinsky was at the White House and saw you on December 28, 1997? Yes, sir, I do. And do you remember talking with Ms. Lewinsky about her subpoena that she had received for the Paula Jones case on that day? I remember talking with Ms. Lewinsky about her testimony. Uh, are about the prospect that she might have to give testimony. And uh, she, uh, she talked to me about that, and I remember that. And you also gave her Christmas gifts, is that not correct, Mr. President? That, that is correct. They were Christmas gifts and they were going away gifts. She was moving to New York uh, to, and taking a new job, starting a new life, and uh, I gave her some gifts. And you actually requested this meeting, is that not correct? I don't remember that, Mr. Bittman, but it's quite possible that I invited her to come by uh, before she left town. But usually when we met, she requested the meetings. And my recollection is in 1997, she asked to meet with me several times when I could not meet with her and did not do so. But it's quite possible that, I, that because she had given me a Christmas gift it, and because she was leaving that I invited her to come by the White House and uh, get a couple of gifts and, uh, before she left town. I don't remember who requested the meeting, though. I'm sorry, I don't. You were alone with her on December 28, 1997? Yes, sir. I was. The gifts that you gave her was a, were a canvas bag from the Black Dog restaurant at Martha's Vineyard. Is that right? Well, that was just I, that was just something I had in the place to to contain the gifts. But I believe that the gifts I gave her were I I put them in that bag. That's what I had there, and I knew she liked things from the Black Dog, so I gave her. I put, I think that's what I put the presents in. I remember what the presents were. I don't remember what the bag was I gave them in. Uh, did you also give her a marble bear bear's head carving from Vancouver, Canada? I did do that. I remember that. You also gave her a Rockettes blanket that has the famous Rockettes from New York? 
I did do that. I had, I had had that in my possession for a couple of years, but had never used it, and she was going to New York, so I thought it would be a nice thing to give her. You gave her a box of cherry chocolates, is that right? I don't remember that, sir. I mean, it, there could have been. I, I just don't remember. I remember giving the bear and the throw. I don't remember what else. And it seems to me like there was one other thing in that bag. I, di I didn't remember the cherry chocolates. How about a pen of the New York skyline? That, that? that could have been in there. I, I seem to remember I gave her some kind of pen. What about a pair of uh, joke sunglasses? I don't remember that. I'm not denying it. I just, I'm telling you what I remember and what I don't. You have given Mr. Lewinsky gifts on other occasions, though. Is that right, Mr. President? Yes, I have. This, though, was, uh, you gave her the most gifts that you had ever given her in a single uh, day. Is that right? Well, that's probably true. It was sort of like a going away present and a Christmas present as well. And she had given me a particularly nice book for Christmas, uh, an antique book on presidents. Uh, she knew that I collected old books, and it was a very nice thing. And uh, I just thought uh, I ought to get up a few things and give them to her uh, before she left. You mentioned that uh, you discussed her subpoena in Paula Jones' case. Tell us specifically, what did you discuss? No, sir, I, I, that's not what I said. I said, my recollection is, I knew by then, of course, that she had gotten a subpoena, and I knew that she was, uh, therefore, was slated to testify. And she mentioned to me, and I believe it was at this meeting, she mentioned, I, I remember a conversation about the possibility of her testifying. I believe it must have occurred on the 28th. She mentioned to me that she did not want to testify. Uh, so, I, so that's how it came up, not in the context of, I heard you have a subpoena, let's talk about it. She raised the issue with me in the context of uh, her desire to avoid testifying, which I certainly understood, not only because there were some embarrassing uh, facts about our relationship, that were inappropriate, but also because a whole lot of innocent people were being traumatized and dragged through the mud by these Jones lawyers with their dragnet strategy. They, uh, and so I, I, and since she didn't know Paula Jones and knew nothing about sexual harassment and did had to, certainly had no experience with that, I, I clearly understood why she didn't want to be a part of it. And you didn't want her to testify, did you? You didn't want her to disclose these embarrassing facts of this inappropriate, intimate relationship that you have. Is that correct? Well, I did not want her to have to testify and go through that, and of course I, I, had, I didn't want her to do that. Of course not. Did you want those facts, not only the fact that she would testify, but did you want the facts that she had about your embarrassing, inappropriate, intimate relationship to be disclosed? Not there, but not in any context. However, I, I never had any high confidence that they wouldn't be. Did anyone, as far as you knew, know about your embarrassing, inappropriate, intimate relationship that you have with Mr. Winston? At that time, I was unaware <clears throat> that she had told anyone else about it, but if if I had known that, I would, it would not have surprised me. Had you told anyone? Absolutely not. Had you tried, in fact, not to let anyone else know about this relationship? Well, of course. What did you do? Well, I never said anything about it, for one thing. And uh, I did what people do when they do the wrong thing. I tried to do it where nobody else was looking at me. How many times did you do that? Well, if you go back to my statement, I remember there were a few times in 96, I can't say with any certainty, there was once in early 97. Uh, 
After she left the White House, I do not believe I ever had any inappropriate contact with her in the rest of 96. Uh, there was one occasion in 97 when, regrettably, that we were together for a few minutes, I think about 20 minutes, and there was inappropriate contact. And after that, to the best of my memory and belief, it did not occur again. Did you tell her in the conversation about her being subpoenaed, she was upset about it, you acknowledged that? I'm sorry, you have to just follow the record. Uh, yes or no, do you agree that she was upset about being subpoenaed? Oh, yes, sir, she was upset. She, well, she, we, she didn't, we didn't talk about subpoena, but she was upset. She said, I don't want to testify. I know nothing about this. I certainly know nothing about sexual harassment. Why do they want me to testify? And uh, I explained to her why they were doing this and why all these women were on these lists and people that they knew good and well had nothing to do with any sexual harassment. I explained to her that it was a political lawsuit they wanted to get whatever they could under oath that was damaging to me, and then they wanted to leak it in violation of the judge's orders and turn up their nose and say, well, you can't prove we did it. Now, that was their strategy. And uh, they were very frustrated because everything they leaked so far was old news. So they desperately were trying to validate this massive amount of money they'd spent uh, by finding some new news. And she didn't want to be caught up in that, and I didn't blame her. You were familiar, weren't you, Mr. President, that she had received a subpoena? You've already acknowledged Yes, that. sir, I was. And Mr. Jordan informed you of that, is that right? No, sir, I believe, um, and I believe I testified to this in my deposition. I think the first person who told me that she had been subpoenaed was Bruce Lindsay. I, I think the first, and I was, in this deposition, it's a little bit cloudy, but I was trying to remember who the first person who told me was. Because the question was, as, again, as I remember, could we go to that in the deposition, since you asked me that? Uh, actually, I think you're, uh, with all respect, I think you may be confusing when Mr. Lindsay, perhaps Mr. Lindsay did tell you she was subpoenaed, I don't know. But in your deposition, you were referring to Mr. Lindsay notifying you that she had been identified as a witness. Where is that, sir? I don't want to get, I just want to, what page is that? Well, actually. It, no, it had to be because I, I saw a witness list much earlier than that. Much earlier than December 28th? Oh, sure. And, and earlier than, she, I, I believe page Monica. 69. <clears throat> I believe Monica Lewinsky's name was on a witness list earlier than she was subpoenaed. Yes. So I believe when I was answering this question, at least I thought I was answering, when I found out. Yes, yeah, see, there's, on page 68, did anyone other than your attorneys ever tell you Monica Lewinsky had been served with a subpoena in this case? Then I said, I don't think so. Then I said, did you ever talk to Monica about the possibility that she might be asked to testify in this case? Then I gave an answer that was non-responsive that really tried to finish the answer above. I said, Bruce Lindsay. I think Bruce Lindsay told me that she was. I think maybe that's the first person who told me that she was. I want to be as accurate as I can. And that, I believe that Bruce is the first person who told me that Monica had gotten a subpoena. Did you, in fact, have a conversation with Mr. Jordan on the evening of December 19, 1997, in which he talk to you about Monica being in Mr. Jordan's office, having a copy of the subpoena, and being upset about being subpoenaed. I remember that Mr. Jordan was in the White House on December 19th and for an event of some kind, that he came up to the residence floor and told me that he had, that Monica had gotten a subpoena and uh, or that Monica was going to have to testify. And I think he told me he recommended a lawyer for her. I believe that's what happened. But it was a very brief conversation. He was there for some other reason. And Mr. Jordan testified that he had also spoken to you at around 5 p.m. and the White House phone logs reflect this, that he called you at around the time he met with Ms. Lewinsky and informed you then that she had been subpoenaed. Is that consistent with your memory? Also on the 19th. 
I had a lot of phone conversations with Vernon about this. I didn't keep records of them. I now have some records. My memory is not clear. My testimony on that was not clear. I, I just knew that I'd talked to Vernon at some time, but I thought that Bruce was the first person who told me. But Mr. Jordan had also told you. Is that right? Yes, I now know I had a conversation with Mr. Jordan about it where he said something to me about uh, that. And that was probably on the 19th, December 19th. Well, I, I know I saw him on the 19th, so I'm quite sure. And if he says he talked to me on the 19th, I believe he would have better records. and. Uh, and I certainly think he's a truthful person. Getting back to your meeting with Ms. Lewinsky on December 28th, you are aware that she's been subpoenaed. You are aware, are you not, Mr. President, that the subpoena called for the production of, among other things, all the gifts that you had given Ms. Lewinsky. You were aware of that on December 28th, weren't you? I'm not sure. And. I understand this is an important question. I did have a conversation with Ms. Lewinsky at some time about gifts, the gifts I'd given her. Uh, I do not know whether it occurred on the 28th or whether it occurred earlier. I do not know whether it occurred when, in person or whether it occurred on the telephone. I have searched my memory for this because I know it's an important issue. Uh, perhaps if you, I can tell you what I remember about the conversation and you can see why I'm having trouble placing the date. Please. The reason I'm not sure it happened on the 28th is that my recollection is that uh, Ms. Lewinsky said something to me like, What if they ask me about the gifts you've given? That's the memory I had. That's why I question whether it happened on the 28th, because she had a subpoena with a request for production. And I told her that if they asked her for gifts, she'd have to give them whatever she had, that, uh, that that's what the law was. And let me also tell you, Mr. Bidman, if you go back and look at my testimony here, I actually asked the Jones lawyers for help on one occasion when they were asking me what gifts I had given her so they could, I, I was never hung up about this gift issue. Maybe it's because I have a different experience, but you know the president I, gets hundreds of gifts a year, maybe more. I have always given a lot of gifts to people, especially if they give me gifts. and. Uh, this was no big deal to me. I mean, it was, it's nice. I enjoy it. I gave dozens of personal gifts to people last Christmas. I give gifts to people all the time. Friends of mine gives me gifts all the time, give me ties, give me books, give me other things. So it was just not a big deal. And I, I told Mr. Lewinsky that just the past I said, you know, if, if they ask you for this, you'll have to give them whatever you have. And I think, Mr. Bittman, it must have happened before then because either that or Ms. Lewinsky didn't want to tell me that she had to subpoena it because that was the language I remember her using. Well, didn't she tell you, Mr. President, that the subpoena specifically called for a hat pin that you had produced, or me, that you had given her? I don't remember that. I remember, sir, I've told you what I remember. That doesn't mean that my memory is accurate. A lot of things have happened in the last several months. A lot of things were happening then, but my memory is she asked me a general question about gifts. And my memory is she asked me in the hypothetical. So it's possible that I had a conversation with her before she got a subpoena. Or it's possible she didn't want to tell me that was part of the subpoena. I don't know. But she may have been worried about this gift business, but it didn't bother me. My experience was totally different. I told her, I said, look, the way these things work is, when a person gets a subpoena, you have to give them whatever you have. That's, what's the, that's what the law is. And I, when I was asked about this in my deposition, even though I was not trying to be helpful, to, particularly to these people that I thought were not well motivated or being honest or even lawful in their conduct vis-a-vis -vis me, that is the Jones legal team, I did ask them specifically to enumerate the gifts. I asked them to help me because I couldn't remember the specifics. So all I'm saying is it didn't... I wasn't troubled by this gift, gift issue.
And your testimony is that Ms. Lewinsky was concerned about her turning over any gifts that you had given her and that your recommendation to her was, absolutely, Monica, you have to produce everything that I have given you. Is that your testimony? My testimony is what I have said, and let me reiterate it. I don't want to agree to a characterization of it. I want to just say what it was. My testimony is that my memory is that on some date in December, and I'm sorry I don't remember when it was, she said, well, what if they ask me about the gifts you have given me? And I said, well, if you get a request to produce those, you have to give them whatever you have. And it just, it, it, to me, it, it, I don't, I didn't then, I don't now see this as a problem. And if she thought it was a problem, I think it uh, must have been from a, really a misapprehension of the circumstances. I certainly never encouraged her not to, to comply lawfully with the subpoena. Mr. President, if your intent was, as you have earlier testified, that you didn't want anyone to know about this relationship you had with Ms. Lewinsky, why would you feel comfortable giving her gifts in the middle of discovery in the Paula Jones case? Well, sir, for one thing, there was no existing improper relationship at that time. I had, for nearly a year, done my best to be a friend to Ms. Lewinsky, to be a counselor to her, to give her good advice, uh, and to help her. She had, for her part, most of the time, accepted the changed circumstances. She talked to me a lot about her life, her job ambitions, and she continued to give me gifts. And I felt uh, that it was the right thing to do to give her gifts back. I have always given a lot of people gifts. I have always been given gifts. I do not think there's anything improper about a man giving a woman a gift or a woman giving a man a gift that necessarily connotes an improper relationship. So it didn't bother me. I wasn't, you know, this was December 28th. I was, I gave her some gifts. I, I wasn't worried about it. I thought it was an all right thing to do. What about notes and letters, cards, letters, and notes to Ms. Lewinsky? After this relationship, this intimate, inappropriate, intimate relationship between you and Ms. Lewinsky ended, she continued to send you numerous intimate notes and cards. Is that right? Well, they were, some of them were, were uh, somewhat intimate. I'd say most of them, most of the notes and cards were, uh, were affectionate, all right, but, but she had clearly accepted the fact that there could be no contact between us that was in any way inappropriate. Now, she, uh, she sent cards sometimes that were just funny, even a little bit off color, but they were funny. She liked to send me cards, and I got a lot of those cards. Uh, several, anyway. I don't know a lot. I got a few. She professed her love to you in these cards after the end of the marriage, didn't she? she well, said she loved you. Sir, the truth is that most of the time, even when she was expressing her feelings for me in affectionate terms, I believe that she had accepted, understood my decision to stop this inappropriate contact. She knew from the very beginning of our relationship that I was apprehensive about it. And I think that, in a way, she felt a little freer to be affectionate because she knew that nothing else was going to happen. I can't explain entirely what was in her mind. But most of these messages were not what you'd call over the top. They weren't things that, 
if you read them, you would say, oh my goodness, these people are having some sort of sexual affair. Mr. Question, Mr. But some of them were quite affectionate. My question was, did she or did she not profess her love to you in these cards and letters that she sent to you after the relationship ended? Most of them were signed love, uh, you know, love, Monica. I, I don't know that I would consider, I don't believe that in most of these cards and letters she professed her love, but she might well have. I, but you know, love can mean different things too, Mr. Bittman. I have, a, I, there are a lot of women with whom I have never had any inappropriate conduct who are friends of mine who will say from time to time, I love you. And I know that they don't mean anything wrong by that. Specifically, Mr. President, do you remember a card she sent you after she saw the movie Titanic, in which she said that she reminisced or, or dreamed about at the romantic feelings that occurred in the movie and how that reminded her of you two? Do you remember that? No, sir, but she could have sent it. I, just because I don't remember it doesn't mean it wasn't there. You're she, not denying that? that, that oh, no. I, I wouldn't deny that. I just don't remember it. If you ask me if I remember it, I don't. She might have done it. Do you ever remember telling her, Mr. President, that she should not write some of the things that she does in these cards and letters that she sends to you because it reveals, if disclosed, uh, this relationship that you had and that she shouldn't do it? I remember uh, telling her she should be careful what she wrote because a lot of it was uh, clearly inappropriate and would be embarrassing if somebody else read it. I don't remember when I said that. I don't remember whether it was in uh, 96 or when it was. I don't remember. Embarrassing in that it was revealing of the intimate relationship that you and she had. Is that right? I do not know when I said this, so I don't know whether we did have any sort of inappropriate relationship at the time I said that to her. I don't remember. But it's obvious uh, that if she wrote things that she should not have written down and someone else read it, that it would be embarrassing. You certainly, she certainly sent you something like that after the relationship began, didn't she? And so therefore there was, at the time she said it, something inappropriate going on. Well, my recollection is that she, uh, that maybe because of changed circumstances in her own life, in 1997, after there was no more inappropriate contact, that she sent me more things in the mail. And that there was sort of a disconnect sometimes between what she was saying and the plain facts of our relationship. And I don't know what caused that. But it may have been dissatisfaction with the rest of her life. I don't know. I, you know, it, she had, from the time I first met her, talked to me about the rest of her personal life. And uh, it may be that, that there was some reason for that. It may be that when I did the right thing and made it stick, that in a way she felt a need to cling more closely or try to get closer to me even though she knew nothing improper was happening or was going to happen. I don't know the answer to that. After you gave her the gifts on December 28th, did you speak with your secretary, Ms. Curry, and ask her to pick up a box of gifts that, or some, some compilation of gifts that Ms. Lewinsky would have? No, sir, I didn't do that. I did not do that. When you testified in the, in the Paul Jones case, this was only two and a half weeks after you had given her these six gifts. You were asked at page 75 of the deposition, lines two through five, <coughs> Well, have you ever given any gifts to Monica Lewinsky? And you answer, I don't recall. And you were correct, and you pointed out that you actually asked them to prompt them, do you know what they were? 
Yeah, I think what I meant there was I don't recall what they were, not that I don't recall whether I had given them. And it, then if you see, they did give me these specifics. And I gave them uh, quite a good explanation here. I remembered very clearly what the facts were about the black dog. Um, and I said that I could have given her the, a hat pen and a, the, a Walt Whitman book, that I did not remember giving her a gold brooch, which was true. I didn't remember it. I may have given it to her, but I didn't remember giving it to her. Um, they didn't ask me about the about the Christmas uh, gifts, and I don't know why I didn't think to say anything about them, but I have to tell you again, I even invited them to have a list. It was obvious to me by this point in the definition, in this deposition, that they had, these people had access to a lot of information from somewhere, and I presume it came from Linda Tripp. And I had no interest in not answering their questions about these gifts. I do not believe that gifts, gifts are incriminating, nor do I think they are wrong. I think it was a good thing to do. I, I'm, not, I'm still not sorry I gave Monica Lewinsky a gift. Why did you assume that that information came from Linda Tripp? I didn't then. You did? I thought you just testified. You no, no, no. I said I now assume that now because of all of the uh, subsequent events. I didn't know. I just knew that Ask that about, some, somebody had access to some information, and they may have known more about this than I did. Let me ask you about the uh, meeting you had with Betty Curry at the White House on Sunday, January 18, this year, the day after your deposition. Uh, first of all, you, you didn't, uh, Mrs. Curry, your secretary of six some years, you never allowed her, did you, to watch whatever whatever intimate activity you did with Ms. Lewinsky, did you? No, sir. Not to my knowledge. And as far as you know, she couldn't hear anything either. Is that right? And there were a couple of times when Monica was there when I asked Betty to be places where she could hear because Monica was upset and I this was after there was all the inappropriate contact had been terminated. I'll talk about the times when you actually had the intimate contact. She was, I believe that, well, first of all, on that one occasion in 1997, I do not know whether Betty was in the White House after the radio address in the Oval Office complex. I believe she probably was, but I'm not sure. But I'm certain that someone was there. I always, always someone was there. In 1996, I think most of the times that uh, Ms. Lewinsky was there, there may not have been anybody around except maybe coming in and out, but not permanently. So I, that's correct. I never, I didn't try to involve Betty in that in any way. Well, not only did you not try to involve her, you specifically tried to exclude her and everyone else. Isn't that right? Well, yes, I, I've, I've never, uh, and it's almost humorous, sir, I, 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 I'd have to be an exhibitionist not to have tried to exclude everyone else. So if Ms. Curry testified that you approached her on the 18th, or you spoke with her, and you said you were always there when she was there, she wasn't, was she? That is Mrs. Curry. She was always there in the White House. And I was concerned. Let me back up and say. What about the radio address, Mr. Pittman? Let me back up and say, Mr. Pittman. I knew about the radio address. I was sick after it was over. And I, I, I was pleased that at that time, it had been nearly a year since uh, any inappropriate contact had occurred with Mr. Lewinsky. I promised myself it wasn't going to happen again. The facts are complicated about what did happen and how it happened, but nonetheless, I'm responsible for it. On that night, she didn't. I was more concerned about the times after that when Ms. Lewinsky was upset, and I wanted to establish at least that I had not, because these questions were, some of them were off the wall. Some of them were way out of line, I thought. 
And what I wanted to, to establish was that uh, Betty was there at all other times in the, in the complex, and I wanted to know what Betty's memory was about uh, what she heard, what she could hear. And uh, what I did not know was, I did not know that, and I was trying to figure out, and I was trying to figure out in a hurry because I knew something was up. So you wanted After to check definition. her memory for what she remembered, and that is That's correct. whether she remembered nothing or whether she remembered an inappropriate, intimate oh, no, relationship. No, no, no. no, I didn't ask her about it in that way. I asked her about what the what I was trying to determine was whether my recollection was right, that she was always uh, in the office complex when Monica was there, and whether she thought she could hear any conversations we had uh, or did she hear any? And then I asked her specifically about a couple of times when, once when I asked her to remain in the dining room, Betty, while I met with Monica in my study. And once when I took Monica into the small office Nancy Hernock occupies right next to Betty's and talked to her there for a few minutes. That's my recollection of that. I was trying to, I knew, uh, Mr. Bittman, to a reasonable certainty that I was going to be asked more questions about this. I didn't really uh, expect you to be in the Jones case at the time. I, I thought what would happen is that it would break in the press, and I was trying to get the facts down. I was trying to understand what the facts were. If Ms. Curry testified that these were not really questions to her, that they were more like statements, is that not true? Well, I can't testify as to what her perception was. I can tell you this. I was trying to get information in a hurry. I was downloading what I remembered. Uh, I think Ms. Curry would also testify that I explicitly told her once I realized that you were involved in the Jones case, you the Office of Independent Counsel, and that she might have to be called as a witness, that she should just go in there and tell the truth, tell what she knew, and be perfectly truthful. So I was not trying to get Betty Curry to say something that was untruthful. I was trying to get as much information as quickly as I could. What information were you trying to get from her when you said, I was never alone with her, right? I don't remember exactly what I did say with her. That's what you say I said. If Miss Curry testified to that, that she says you told her, I was never alone with her, right? Well, I was never did you, alone did you with not her. Did you say that, Mr. President? Mr. Bittman, just a minute. I was never alone with her right might be a question. And what I might have meant by that is in the Oval Office complex. Well, you knew the answer. Uh, could, we've been going for more than an hour. Would you mind if we take a break? I need to go to the restroom. Uh, 238. Two thirty-eight. Oh, sorry, forty-eight. Excuse me. Forty-eight. Mr. President, I want to, before I go into a new subject area, briefly go over something you were talking about with Mr. Bittman. The statement of uh, your attorney, Mr. Bennett, in Paul Jones' deposition. Council is fully aware, it's page 54, line 5. Council is fully aware that Ms. Lewinsky has filed, has an affidavit which they are in possession of, saying that there is absolutely no sex of any kind, in any manner, shape, or form with President Clinton. That statement is made by your attorney in front of Judge Susan Wright, correct? That's correct. Your, that statement is a completely false statement. Whether or not Mr. Bennett knew of your relationship with Ms. Lewinsky, the statement that there was no sex of any kind in any manner, shape or form with President Clinton was an utterly false statement. Is that correct? It depends upon what the meaning of the word is. Yes. If the if he if is means is and never has been, that is not a, that's one thing. If it means 
there is none. That was a completely true statement. But to, as I have testified, I'd like to testify again. <clears throat> this is, it is somewhat unusual for a client to be asked about his lawyer's statements instead of the other way around. I was not paying a great deal of attention to this exchange. I was focusing on my own testimony. And uh, if you go back and look at the sequence of this, you will see that the Jones lawyers uh, decided that this was going to be the Lewinsky deposition, not the Jones deposition. And given the facts of their case, I can understand why they made that decision. But that is not how I prepared for it. That is not how I was thinking about it. And I am not sure, Mr. Weisenberg, as I sit here today, that I sat there and followed all these interchanges between the lawyers. I, I'm quite sure that I didn't follow all the interchanges between the lawyers uh, all that carefully. And I, I don't really believe, therefore, that I can say Mr. Bennett's testimony or statement is, is testimony and is imputable to me. I, didn't, I don't know that I was even paying that much attention to it. You told us you were very well prepared for the deposition. No, I said I was very well prepared to talk about Paula Jones and to talk about Kathleen Willey because she had uh, made a related charge. She was the only person that I think I was asked about who had anything to do with uh, anything that would remotely approximate sexual harassment. The rest of this it looked to me like was more a way to harass me. You're the President of the United States and your attorney tells the United States District Court Judge that there's no sex of any kind, any way, shape, or form whatsoever, and you feel no obligation to do anything about that at that deposition, Mr. President. I have told you, Mr. Weisenberg, I will tell you for a third time, I am not even sure that when Mr. Bennett made that statement that I was concentrating on the exact words he used. Now, if someone had asked me on that day, are you having any kind of sexual relations with Ms. Lewinsky? That is, ask me a question in the present tense. I would have said no, and it would have been completely true. Was Mr. Bennett aware of this, this tense Based distinction you're making. I don't, I don't, I'm going to object to any uh, questions about uh, communications with private counsel. Well, well, the witness has already testified, I think, that Mr. Mr. Bennett didn't know about the inappropriate relationship with Ms. Lewinsky. And I, I guess... Um, well, you'll have to ask him. You know, he was not a sworn witness, and I was not paying that close attention to what he was saying. I, I've told you that repeatedly. I, I was... I don't... I, I never even focused on that until I read it in this transcript in preparation for this testimony. When I was in there, I didn't think about my lawyers. I was frankly thinking about myself and my testimony and trying to answer the questions. I just want to make sure I understand, Mr. President. Do you mean today that because you were not engaging in sexual activity with Ms. Lewinsky during the deposition that the statement of Mr. Bennett might be literally true? No, sir. I mean that at the time of the deposition, it had been, that was well beyond it, any point of improper contact between me and Ms. Lewinsky. So that anyone generally speaking in the present tense saying there is not uh, an improper relationship would be telling the truth if that person said there was not in the present tense. Present tense encompassing many months. That's what I meant by that. Not that I was, I wasn't trying to give you a cute answer, that I was obviously not involved in anything improper during the deposition. I was trying to tell you that, generally speaking, in the present tense, if someone said that, that would be true. But I don't know what Mr. Bennett had in his mind. I don't know. I didn't pay any attention to this colloquy that went on. I was waiting for my instructions as a witness to go forward. I was worried about my own testimony. I want to go back to the day Monica Lewinsky was subpoenaed, wasn't it? The, the night that he came to see you. 
I don't have independent <clears throat> memory of that, but you would probably know that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a record of when she got her subpoena. If Mr. Jordan has told us that he spoke with you over the phone within about an hour of Monica receiving her subpoena and later visited you that very day, night at the White House to discuss it, again, you'd have no reason to doubt him. Is that correct? I've, I believe I've already testified about that uh, here today. But I had lots of conversations with Vernon. I'm sure that I had lots of conversations with him that included comments about this. And if he has a specific memory of when I had some conversation on a certain day, uh, I would be inclined to trust his memory over mine because <clears throat> under the present circumstances, my head's probably more cluttered than his and my schedule's probably busier and he probably got better records. And when Mr. Jordan met with you at the residence that night, sir, he asked you if you had been involved in a sexual relationship with Monica Lewinsky, didn't he? I do not remember exactly what the nature of the conversation was. I do remember <clears throat> that I told him, <clears throat> excuse me, that I told him that there was no sexual relationship between me and Monica Lewinsky, which was true. And uh, that we then the, all I remember for the rest is that he said he had uh, referred her to a lawyer, and I believe it was uh, Mr. Carter. And I don't believe I've ever met Mr. Carter. I don't think I know him. Mr. President, if Mr. Jordan has told us that he had a very disturbing conversation with Ms. Lewinsky that day, then went over to visit you at the White House, and that before he asked you the question about sexual relationship, related that disturbing conversation to you, the conversation being that Ms. Lewinsky had a fixation on you and thought that perhaps the First Lady would leave you at the end of the, that you would leave the First Lady at the end of your term and come be with Ms. Lewinsky. Do you have any reason to doubt him that it was on that night that that conversation happened? I, all I can tell you, sir, is I, I, I certainly don't remember him saying that. Now, he could have said that. Because, uh, as you know, a great uh, many things happened in the ensuing two or three days. And I could have just forgotten it, but I don't remember him ever saying that. At any time? Uh, no, I don't remember him saying that. What I remember was that he said that Monica came to see him, that she was upset, uh, that she was going to have to testify, that he had referred her to a lawyer. In fact, she was very distraught about the subpoena, according to Mr. Jordan, wasn't she? Well. He said she was upset about it. I remember that. I don't remember any, uh, at any time when he said this, uh, this other thing you just quoted me. I'm sorry, I just don't remember that. That is something that one would be likely to remember, don't you think, Mr. President? I think I would, and I'd be happy to share it with you if I did. Uh, I, I only had uh, one encounter with Ms. Lewinsky I seem to remember, which was somewhat maybe reminiscent of that, but... Uh, not that, uh, if you will, obsessive, if that's the way you want to use that word. Do you recall him at all telling you that he was concerned about her fascination with you? Even if you don't remember the specific conversation about you leaving the First Lady. I recall him saying he thought that she was uh, upset with, uh, uh, ups uh, somewhat fixated on me that she acknowledged that she was not having a sexual relationship with me and that she did not want to be drug into the Jones lawsuit. That's what I recall. And I recall his uh, getting, uh, saying that he had recommended a lawyer to her and she had gone to see the lawyer. That's what I recall. I don't remember the other thing you mentioned. I just, uh, I might well remember it if he had said it. Maybe he said it and I've forgotten it, but I don't, I can't tell you that I remember that. Mr. President, you swore under oath in the Jones case that you didn't think anyone other than your lawyers had ever told you that Monica Lewinsky had been subpoenaed. Page 68, line 22 through page 69, line 3. Here's the testimony, sir. Question. We've gone over it a little bit before. Did anyone other than your attorneys ever tell you that Monica Lewinsky had been served with a subpoena in the case? Answer, I don't think so. Now, 
this deposition was taken just three and a half weeks after, by your own testimony, Vernon Jordan made a trip at night to the White House to tell you, among other things, that Monica Lewinsky had been subpoenaed and was upset about it. Why did you give that testimony under oath in the Jones case, sir? Well, Mr. Weisenberg, I think you have to, again, you have to put this in the context of the flow of questions. And I've already testified to this once today. I will testify to it again. Uh, my answer to the next question, I think, is a way of <coughs> finishing my answer to the question and the answer you said there. I was trying to remember who the first person, other than Mr. Mr. Bennett, I don't think Mr. Bennett, who the first person told me that uh, who told me Paula Jones had, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, Monica Lewinsky had a subpoena. And I thought that Bruce Lindsay was the first person. And that's how I was trying to remember that. Uh, keep in mind, sort of like today, these questions are being kind of put at me rapid fire, but unlike today, I hadn't had the opportunity to prepare at this level of detail. I, I didn't. Uh, I was trying to keep a lot of things in my head uh, that I had remembered with regard to the Paula Jones case and the Kathleen Willie matter because I knew I would be asked about them. And I gave the best answers I could. Several of my answers are somewhat jumbled, but this is an honest attempt here. If you read both these answers, it's obvious they're both answers to that question you quoted, to remember the first person who was not Mr. Bennett who told me. And I don't believe Vernon was the first person who told me. I believe Bruce Lindsay was. Let me read the question because I want to talk about the first person issue. The question on line 25 of page 68 is, did anyone other than your attorneys ever tell you that Monica Lewinsky had been served with a subpoena in this case? Answer, I don't think so. You would agree with me, sir, that the question doesn't say, the question doesn't say anything about who was the first person. It just says, did anyone tell you. Isn't that correct? That's right. And I, I said Bruce Lindsay because I was trying to struggle with who, where I'd heard this. And they were free to ask a follow-up question, and they didn't. Mr. President, three and a half weeks before, Mr. Jordan had made a special trip to the White House to tell you Ms. Lewinsky had been subpoenaed. She was distraught. She had a fixation over you. And you couldn't remember that three and a half weeks later? Mr. Weisenberg, if they had access to all this information from their conversations with Linda Tripp, if that was the basis of it, they were free to ask me more questions. They may have been trying to trick me. Now, they knew more about the details of my relationship with Monica Lewinsky. I'm not sure everything they knew was true because I don't know. I've not heard these tapes or anything. But they knew a lot more than I did. And instead of trying to trick me, what they should have done is to ask me specific questions. And I, and I invited them on more than one occasion to ask follow-up questions. This is the third or fourth time that you seem to be complaining that I did not do all their work for them. That just sitting here answering these questions to the best of my memory with limited preparation was not enough that I should have actually been doing all their work for them. Now, they'd been up all night with Linda Tripp who had betrayed her friend Monica Lewinsky, stabbed her in the back and given them all this information, they could have helped more. If they wanted to ask me follow-up questions, they could. They didn't. I'm sorry. I did the best I could. Can you tell the grand jury what is tricky about the question? Did anyone other than your attorneys ever tell no, you? No, there's nothing. I'm just telling I have explained. I will now explain for the third time, sir. I was being asked a number of questions here. I was struggling to remember them. There were lots of things that had gone on during this time period that had nothing to do with Monica Lewinsky. You know, I, I believed then, I believe now, that Monica Lewinsky could have sworn out an honest affidavit that under reasonable circumstances, and without the benefit of what Linda Tripp did to her, would have given her a chance not to be a witness in this case. So 
I didn't have perfect memory of all these events that have now, in the last seven months, since Ms. Lewinsky was kept for several hours by four or five of your lawyers and four or five FBI agents, uh, as if she were a serious felon, uh, these things have become the most important matters in the world. At the moment they were occurring, many other things were going on. I honestly tried to remember when, you know, if somebody asks you, has anybody ever talked to you about this? You normally think, well, where was the first time I heard that? That's all I was trying to do here. I was not trying to say, not Vernon Jordan, but Bruce Lindsay. Everybody knows Vernon Jordan is a friend of mine. I probably would have talked to Vernon Jordan about the Monica Lewinsky problem if he had never been involved in it. So I was not trying to mislead them. I was trying to answer this question with the first person who told me that. Now, I realize that wasn't the specific question. They were free to ask follow-ups, just like you're asking follow-ups today. And I can't explain why I didn't answer every question in the way you seem to think I should have. And I certainly can't explain why they didn't ask what seemed to me to be logical follow-ups especially since they spent all that time with Linda Tripp the night before. You told us that you understand your obligation then as it is now is to tell the whole truth, sir. You, re you recall that? I took the oath here. If Vernon you Jordan, even read me a definition of the oath. If Vernon Jordan uh, has told us that you have an extraordinary memory, one of the greatest memories he's ever seen in a politician, would that be something you would care to dispute? No, I do have a good memory. At least, I have had a good memory in my life. You understand that if you answered, I don't think so, to the question, has anyone other than your attorneys uh, told you that Monica Lewinsky has been served with a subpoena in this case, that if you answered, I don't think so, but you really knew Vernon Jordan had be, been telling you all about it, you understand that that would be a false statement, presumably perjurious. Mr. Weisenberg, I have testified about this three times. Now I will do it the fourth time. I am not going to answer your trick questions. I, people don't always hear the same questions in the same way. They don't always answer them in the same way. I was so concerned about the question they asked me that the next question I was asked, I went back to the, que the previous question trying to give an honest answer about the first time I heard about the Lewinsky subpoena. I, look, I could have had no reasonable expectation that anyone would ever know that, that, that uh, or not, excuse me, not know if this thing, if, if, that I would talk to Vernon Jordan about nearly everything. I was not interested in, uh, if the implication of your question is that somehow I didn't want anybody to know I'd ever talk to Vernon Jordan about this, that's just not so. It's also, uh, if I could say, say one thing about my memory. I have been blessed and advantaged in my life with a good memory. I have been shocked and so have members of my family and friends of mine at how many things that I have forgotten in the last six years. But I think because of the pressure and the pace and the volume of events in the president's life compounded by the pressure of your four-year inquiry and all the other things that have happened. I'm amazed there are lots of times when I literally can't remember last week. If you ask me, did you talk to Vernon, when's the last time you talked to Vernon Jordan? What time of day was it? When did you see him? What did you say? My answer was the last, uh, you know, if you answer me, when does the last time you saw uh, a friend of yours in California? If you ask me a lot of questions like that, my memory is not what it was when I came here because my life is so crowded. And now that, as I said, you have made this the most important issue in America. I mean, it, you have made it the most important issue in America from your point of view. At the time this was occurring, even though I was concerned about it and I hoped she didn't have to testify and I hoped this wouldn't come out, 
I felt, I will say again, that she could honestly fill out an affidavit that in, under reasonable circumstances would relieve her of the burden of testifying. And I am not trying to exclude the fact that I talked to Vernon here. I just, all I can tell you is, I believe this answer reflects, I was trying to remember the first person who told me who was not Mr. Bennett, and I believe it was Bruce Lindsay. As, as you yourself recall, just recalled, Mr. President, uh, Vernon Jordan not only discussed the subpoena with you that, that night, but discussed Frank Carter, uh, the lawyer he'd gotten from Ms. Lewinsky, and also uh, Mr. Jordan discussed with you over the next few weeks after the 19th of December, uh, the, in addition to the job aspects of Ms. Lewinsky's job, he discussed with you her affidavit that she was preparing in the case. Is that correct, sir? I believe that he did notify us, I think, when she signed her affidavit. I have a memory of that. Or he seemed like he said that she had signed her affidavit. If he's told us that he notified you around January 7th when she signed her affidavit, that you generally understood that it would deny a sexual relationship, do you have any reason to doubt that? No. So that's the affidavit. Uh, the lawyer uh, and the subpoena. And yet when you were asked, sir, at the Jones deposition about Vernon Jordan, and specifically about whether or not he had discussed the lawsuit with you, you didn't reveal that to the court. I want to refer you to page 72. Line 16 is where this starts. It's going to go down. It might go down somewhat. Line 16, question, has it ever been reported to you that he, and uh, that's referring to Mr. Jordan. At line 12, you're asked, you know a man named Vernon Jordan? You answer, I know him well. Going down to 16, has it ever been reported to you that he met with Monica Lewinsky and talked about this case? This is your answer or portion of it. I knew that he met with her. I think Betty suggested that he meet with her. Anyway, he met with her. I thought that he talked to her about something else. Why didn't you tell the court when you were under oath and sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, that you had been talking with Vernon Jordan about the case, about the affidavit, the lawyer, the subpoena? Well, that's not the question I was asked. I was not asked any question about... Uh, I was asked, has it ever been reported to you that he met with Monica Lewinsky and talked about this case? I believe, I may be wrong about this, my impression was that uh, at the time, I was focused on the meetings. I believe the meetings he had were meetings about her moving to New York and getting a job. I knew at some point that she had uh, told him that she needed some help because she'd gotten a subpoena. I'm not sure I know whether she did that in a meeting or a phone call. And uh, I was not, I was not focused on that. I know that, I know Vernon helped her to get a lawyer, Mr. Carter, and I, I believe that he did it uh, after she had called him, but I'm not sure. But I knew that the main source of their meetings was about her move to New York and her getting a job. Are you saying, sir, that you forgot when you were asked this question that Vernon Jordan had come on December 19th, just three and a half weeks before, and said that he'd met that day, the day that Monica got the subpoena? It's quite po it's a sort of a jumbled answer. It's, it's quite possible that I got mixed up between uh, whether she had met with him or talked to him on the telephone in those three and a half weeks. Again, I say, sir, just from the tone of your voice and the way you're asking questions here, it's obvious that this is the most important thing in the world uh, and that everybody was focused on all the details at the time. Uh, but that's not the way it worked. I was, 
I was doing my best to remember. Now, keep in mind, I don't know if this is true, but the news reports are that uh, Linda Tripp talked to you, then went and talked to the Jones lawyers, and you know that she prepared them for this. Now, maybe you seem to be criticizing me because they didn't ask better questions, and as if you didn't prepare them well enough to, to sort of set me up or something. I, I don't know what's going on here. All I can tell you is, I didn't remember all the details of all this. I didn't remember what, when Vernon talked to me about Monica Lewinsky, where she talked to him on the telephone or had a meeting. I didn't remember all those details. I was focused on the fact that Monica went to meet with Vernon after Betty helped him set it up and had subsequent meetings to talk about her move to New York. Now keep in mind, at this time, at this time, until this date here, when it's obvious that something funny's going on here, and there's some sort of a, a gotcha game at work in this deposition. Until this date, I didn't know that Ms. Lewinsky's deposition wasn't going to be sufficient for her to avoid testifying. I, I didn't, excuse you know, me, so her, all these details. You mean her affidavit? I'm, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry, her affidavit, thank you. So I don't necessarily remember all the details of all these questions you're asking me, because there was a lot of other things going on, and at the time they were going on, until all this came out, this was not the most important thing in my life. This was just another thing in my life. But Vernon Jordan met with you, sir, and he reported that he had met with Monica Lewinsky, and the discussion was about the lawsuit, and you didn't inform under oath the court of that in your deposition. I gave the best answer I could based on the best memory I had at the time they asked me the question. That's the only answer I can give you, sir. And, and I think I may have been confused in my memory because I've also talked to him on the phone about what he said about whether he talked to her or met with her. <clears throat> That's all I can tell you. I, but let me say again, I don't have the same view about this deposition, I mean this affidavit that I think you do. I felt very strongly that Ms. Lewinsky and everybody else that didn't know anything about Paula Jones and anybody about anything about sexual harassment that she and others were themselves being harassed for political purposes in the hope of getting damaging information that the Jones lawyers could unlawfully leak. Now, I believe then, I believe today, that she could execute an affidavit which under reasonable circumstances with fair-minded, non-politically oriented people would result in her being relieved of the burden to be put through the kind of testimony that thanks to uh, Linda Tripp's uh, work with you and with the Jones lawyers, she would have been put through. I don't think that's dishonest. I don't think that's illegal. I think what they were trying to do to her and all these other people who knew nothing about sexual harassment was outrageous, just so they could hurt me politically. So I just don't have the same attitude about this either. Well, you're not telling our grand jurors that if you think the case was a political case or a setup, Mr. President, that that would give you the right to commit perjury. No, sir. To tell the full no, truth. sir. In the face of their, the Jones lawyers, the people that were questioning me, in the face of their illegal leaks, their constant, unrelenting illegal leaks, in a lawsuit that I knew, and that by the time this deposition and this discovery started, they knew was a bogus suit on the law and a bogus suit on the facts. The question in the face of that, I knew that in the face of their illegal activity, I still had to behave lawfully. But I wanted to be legal without being particularly helpful. I thought that was, that was what I was trying to do. And this is the, you're the first person who ever suggested to me that, that I should have been doing their lawyer's work for them when they were perfectly free to ask follow-up questions. On one or two occasions, Mr. Bennett invited them to ask follow-up questions. It now appears to me they didn't because they were afraid I would give them a truthful answer and that there had been some communication between you and Ms. Tripp and them and they were trying to set me up and trick me. And now you seem to be complaining that they didn't do a good enough job. I did my best, sir, at this time. I did not know what I now know about this. A lot of other things were going on in my life. Did I want this to come out? No. Was I embarrassed about it? Yes. 
Did I ask her to lie about it? No. Did I believe there could be a truthful affidavit? Absolutely. Now that's all I know to say about this. I will continue to answer your questions as best I can. You're not going back on your earlier statement that you understood you were sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to the folks at that deposition, are you, Mr. President? No, sir, but I think we might as well put this out on the table. Uh, you tried to get me to give a broader interpretation to my oath than just my obligation to tell the truth. In other words, you tried to say, even though these people are treating you in an illegal manner and illegally leaking these depositions, you should be a good lawyer for them. And if they don't have enough sense to write, uh, ask a question, and even if Mr. Bennett invited them to ask follow-up questions, if they didn't do it, you should have done all their work for them. Now, so I will admit this, sir. My goal in this deposition was to be truthful, but not particularly helpful. I did not wish to do the work of the Jones lawyers. I deplored what they were doing. I deplored the innocent people they were tormenting and traumatizing. I deplored their illegal leaking. I deplored the fact that they knew, once they knew our evidence, that this was a bogus lawsuit and that because of the funding they had from my political enemies, they were putting ahead. I deplored it, but I was determined to walk through the minefield of this deposition without violating the law, and I believe I did. You're not saying, are you, Mr. President, in terms of doing the work for the Jones folks, the Jones lawyers, that uh, you, could, you could say, as part of your not helping them, I don't know to a particular question when you really knew, and that it was up to them, even if you really knew the answer, it was up to them to do the follow-up. That you kind of had a one free, no, I don't sir. know. If I could finish, I've been very patient, Mr. President, in letting you finish. You didn't think you had a free shot to say, I don't know or I don't recall, but when you really did know and you did recall, and it was just up, up to them, even if you weren't telling the truth, to do a follow-up and to, and to catch you? No, sir, I'm not saying that. And if I could give you one example. That's why I felt that I had to come back to that question where I said I don't know that and talk about Bruce Lindsay because I was trying, I was honestly trying to remember how I'd first heard this. I wasn't hung up about talking about this. All I'm saying is, the, it, l let me say something sympathetic to you. I've been pretty tough, so let me say something sympathetic. All of you are intelligent people. You've worked hard on this. You've worked for a long time. You've gotten all the facts. You've seen a lot of evidence that I haven't seen. And it's, a, it's an embarrassing and personally painful thing, the truth about my relationship with Ms. Lewinsky. So th the natural assumption is that while all this was going on, I must have been focused on nothing but this, therefore I must remember everything about it in the sequence and form in which it occurred. All I can tell you is I was concerned about it. I was glad she saw a lawyer. I was glad she was doing an affidavit. But there were a lot of other things going on, and I don't necessarily remember it all. And I don't know if I can convince you of that, but I tried to be honest with you about my mindset about this deposition, and I'm just trying to explain that I, I don't have the memory that you assume that I should about some of these things. I want to talk to you for a bit, Mr. President, about the North, uh, incident that happened at the Northwest Gate of the White House on December 5th, uh, sorry, December 6th, 1997. Give me just a moment. Uh, that was a. Uh, let me ask you first. In early 19, in early December 1997, the Paula Jones case was pending. Correct. Yes, sir. You were represented by Mr. Bennett, of course. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yes, I did. He How was. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, yes, he was representing me. How often did you talk to him or meet with him, if you can just recall, uh, at that time in the litigation? Well, we met, I would say, I wish Mr. Ruff were answering this question instead of me. His memory would be better. We met probably, uh, oh, 
for a long time we didn't meet all that often, maybe once a month. And then the closer we got to the deposition, we would meet more frequently. So maybe by this time we were meeting more. We also, there was a period when <clears throat> we had been approached about... Yeah, the question only goes to the number of meetings, not the content. Uh, I understand. We're not talking about the content. There was a... There was a period uh, in which we, I think back in the summer before this, when we had met more frequently. But I would say normally once a month, sometimes something would be happening, we'd meet more. And then as we moved toward the deposition, we would begin to meet more. A witness list came out on December 5th of 1997 with Monica Lewinsky's name on it. Mr. President, uh, when did you find out that Monica's name was on that witness list? I believe that I found out uh, late in the afternoon on the, on the 6th. That's what I believe. I've, I've tried to remember with great precision and because I thought you would ask me about this day, I tried to remember the logical question, which is whether, whether I knew it on the 6th and if so, at what time. I don't, I, I had a meeting in the late afternoon on the 5th, on the 6th, excuse me, on the 6th, and I, I believe that's when I learned about it. Now on the morning of the 6th, Monica Lewinsky uh, came to the Northwest Gate and found out that uh, you were being visited by uh, Eleanor Mondale at the time and had an extremely angry uh, reaction. You know that, sir, now, don't you? I have, I have, I know that Monica Lewinsky came to the gate on the 6th and uh, apparently directly called in and wanted to see me and couldn't and was angry about it. I know that. And she expressed that anger to uh, Betty Curry over the telephone, isn't that correct, sir? That Betty told me that. And she then later expressed her anger to you in one of her telephone conversations with Betty Curry, is that correct? You mean, did I talk to her on the phone? Monica Lewinsky that day, before she came in to visit in the White House. Mr. Weisenberg, I remember that she came in to visit that day. I remember that she was upset. I don't recall whether I talked to her on the phone before she came in to visit, but I may well have. I, I'm, not, I'm not denying it that I did. I just don't recall that. And Mrs. Curry and yourself were very irate that Ms. Lewinsky had overheard uh, that you were in the Oval Office with a visitor on that day. Isn't that correct? That you and Mrs. Curry were very irate about that. Well, I don't remember all that. Uh, what I remember is that she was very, uh, Monica was very upset. She got upset from time to time. And, um, and I was, you know, I couldn't see her. I had, I was doing as I remember, uh, I had some other work to do that morning and she had just sort of showed up and wanted to be let in and wanted to come in at a certain time and she wanted everything to be that way and we couldn't see her. Now, I did arrange to see her later that day, and I was upset about her conduct. I'm not sure I knew or focused on at that moment exactly the question you asked. I remember I, was, I thought her conduct was inappropriate that day. I want to go back and I want to take them one at a time. Number one, did you find out at some point during that day that Monica had overheard uh, from somebody in the Secret Service that you were meeting with Ms. Mondale and that Monica got very irate about that. I knew that at some point. I don't know whether I found out that that day. I knew that day, I knew that somehow she knew that among, that, that Eleanor Mondale was in to see us that day. I knew that. I don't know that I knew how she knew that on that day. I that don't remember that. Pardon me, that leads into my second question, which is, weren't you uh, irate 
at the Secret Service precisely because they had revealed this information to Ms. Lewinsky on that very day. So irate that you told several people, uh, or at least one person, that somebody should be fired over this on that very day. I don't remember whether it happened on that very day, but let me tell you that uh, the Uniform Secret Service, uh, if that is in fact what happened, and I s will stipulate that that is, that no one should be telling anybody, not anybody, not a member of my staff, who the president is meeting with. That's an inappropriate thing to do. So. I would think that uh, if that in fact is what I heard when I heard it, I would have thought that was a bad thing. I don't know that I said that. I don't, I don't remember what I said and I don't remember to whom I said it. It, it would be an inappropriate thing, sir, and, and that leads into my next question is that why did Mrs. Curry, on your instructions later that day, tell many of the Secret Service officers involved that it never happened to forget about it? That what never happened? The incident that you were so irate about earlier. The incident of somebody disclosing to, Mrs. to Ms. Lewinsky that Ms. Mondale was in the Oval Office with you. I don't know the answer to that. I think maybe, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. You don't, don't recall answer. that you later gave orders uh, to the effect that we're going to pretend this never happened or no, something sir. like that. No, sir. I don't recall that. I, first of all, I don't recall that I gave orders to fire anybody, if that was the implication of your first statement. It wasn't an implication. Actually, the question was that you initially wanted somebody fired. You were so mad that you wanted somebody fired. I don't remember that, first of all. I remember thinking it was an inappropriate thing to do. And uh, I... I remember, as I usually do when I'm mad, I, I, after a while I wasn't so mad about it, and I'm, I'm quite aware that Ms. Klawinski has a way of getting information out of people when she's uh, either charming or determined. And um, it, I, I could have just said, well, I'm not so mad about it anymore, but I, I don't remember the whole sequence of events you're talking to me about now, except I do remember that Somehow Monica found out Ellen Rondale was there. I, I learned either that day or later that one of the uniform division uh, personnel had told her. I, do, I thought then it was a mistake. I think now it was a mistake. I'm not sure it's a mistake someone should be terminated over. I think that you, you, know, you could just tell them not to do that anymore. In fact, it would kind of be an overreaction to get irate or terminate somebody for revealing to a former White House staffer who visits. Uh, where the president is, don't you think, sir? Well, it would depend upon the facts. I think on the whole, people in the uniform civil uh, secret service have, who are working on the gate have no business telling anybody anything about the president's schedule. And Just as a general principle, I didn't mind anybody knowing that uh, she was there, if that's what you're saying. I could care less about that, but I think that the, uh, the schedule itself, the the, these uniformed people, you know, somebody shouldn't just be able to come up on the street and because they know who the Secret Service agent is, he says who the president's with. I don't think that's proper. I agree. But on the other hand, I, w I didn't, uh, you know, I, I wanted to know what happened. I think we found out what happened, and then they were, I think, told not to let it happen again, and I think that's the way it should have been handled. I think it was handled in the appropriate way. And you have no knowledge of the fact that Secret Service officers were told later in the, d in the day something to the effect of this never happened, this event never happened. You have no knowledge of that. So I'm not sure anybody ever told that to me. I mean, I thought you were asked, let me just say, my interpretation of this, of your previous question, was different than what you're asking now. What I remember was being upset that this matter would be discussed that by, by, by anybody. That it, incidental, it happened to be Monica Lewinsky. And that, that whatever I said, uh, I don't recall, but then 
thinking that the appropriate thing to do was to say, look, let's just, this is not an appropriate thing for you to be talking about the president's schedule, and it shouldn't happen again. Now, the question you seem to be asking me now, I just want to be sure I'm getting the right question. is whether I gave instructions in effect to pretend that Monica Lewinsky was never at the gate. And if, effect, uh, and, 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 if that is, and if that is the question you're asking me, I don't believe I ever did that, sir. I certainly have no memory of doing that. Or anything to that effect. Is I don't that know what that testimony? means. I, what does that mean, anything to that effect? Well, Mr. President, you, you've told us that you were not going to try to help the Joneses' attorneys, and I think it's clear from your testimony that you were pretty literal at times. So that's why I'm saying I don't necessarily know the exact words. The question, the question was, do you have any knowledge of the, no, fact, I, of the fact that later in the day, on Saturday the 6th of December 1997, Secret Service people were then were told something to this effect, this event never happened. Let's just pretend this event did not happen. Do you have knowledge of it or not? No, sir. And, and I, I didn't instruct the Secret Service in that regard. I have no memory of saying anything to anybody in the Secret Service that would have triggered that kind of instruction. Did you tell Captain Purdy while you were standing in the doorway between the Oval Office and Betty Curry's office, did you tell Captain Purdy of the Uniform Division I hope I can count on your discretion in this matter at the end of the day when y'all were talking about that earlier incident. Did you tell him that or anything like that, sir? I don't remember anything I said to him uh, in that regard. I have no recollection of that, whatever. Let me take a break now. Thank you. Um, 338.